For the students, um, I want to welcome Manyami Abode. Uh, she's an assistant professor of architecture at the Talman College of Architecture and Urban Planning at the University of Michigan. It's great to have her today. Um, she's also the director of DART, the Digital Architecture Research and Technologies Lab. Um, she has a Bachelor's of Science in Architecture um, from from Curtin University in Australia. Um, she also has an engineering degree from Lulea University in Sweden, a PhD in architecture from KTH School of Architecture, also in Sweden. I so, also saw that you had a, another post-architecture degree from in Sweden as well. Um, you have a, a postdoctoral right. research position at the ETH in Switzerland. So you've been all over the place exploring everything. Um, pretty amazing um you have she has extensive expertise in additive manufacturing which is why i asked her here today to talk to you guys uh she's completed several projects um the d fab house was one that she worked on which is the first full-scale architecture project using 3d printed sand casting yeah for for concrete form work um, and the deep facade project, which utilizes added manufacturing for metal cast uh, facade panels. I hope you talk a little bit about some of those and maybe your work at, at DART. Um, please welcome Anya here uh, and take it away. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Marshall. Uh, well, thanks for having me here. Um, so I'm just going to share a screen. Let me see if that works first, and then we go from there. So you two have my screen now and let's get the keynote going. Um, all right, so is that the right presentation? Yes. Okay, um, so please do interrupt me if you wish. Well, thank you for the very kind introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be part of this uh, class right now today. Usually uh, it doesn't happen that it's so relaxed. So I'm happy to be here. And um, uh, as, as Marshall just noted, I'm an assistant professor of architecture at Topman College. Uh, where I also direct my own lab, uh, Digital Architecture Research and Technologies, DART. Um, so um, today I will uh, basically focus our presentation on future of construction, uh, robotic and additive manufacturing. Uh, it will start with additive and ends with robotic. Um, but uh, do feel free to interrupt me as I'm going through. Um, I'm not sure where, which area you guys are focusing right now. So um, the background that I'll give you, it will be on, uh, like I'll start with a background of actually our, why we are doing what we are doing. I'll show you a bit of the work, uh, which is also initiated, or I lead, led in uh, ETH Switzerland. Um, on additive manufacturing and how computation would play an important role in this. And then from there, um, I'll show you the, uh, the lightweight concrete lab and the facade project. Then getting to robotic 3D printing of the polymer, uh, the energy building envelope system that we are uh, working on right now at Michigan. So, um, Let's, uh, let's see. In the next 30 years, uh, the urban population is expanded to, uh, expected to double. It's kind of projected population of the urban context. This means we have to construct two times more, uh, more than what we have, more houses, more infrastructure in a very short period of time. Um, but, uh, to respond to this uh, demand, uh, construction is already facing challenges. Um, some of these very serious challenges is that we are running out of material. Uh, for example, sand, which is the main ingredient of concrete, is already scarce. Uh, we are also running out of labor, so um, we don't have enough uh, 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 skilled workers and labor to respond to this high demand of construction. Um, we also, as an industry uh, and our product together, have a high footprint on CO2 emissions. So construction, uh, 
together with the building performance contribute to about 40% of the world's CO2 emission, out of which 11% relates to the construction processes and the material processes. Um, and um, the traditional construction processes uh, have proven unfit to, uh, to uh, resolve this uh, scarcity of material, uh, lack of uh, uh, labor, or the respond to this demand of uh, housing would be actually problematic. Um, we are still building the way we used to build like 70 years ago, the image on the left side and the image on the right side are 70 years apart, but we don't see much difference in our process of making. We still have labors on the side. Our parts are very unprecise. Let's put it the other way, Con construction is messy and it's unprecise and it's labor intensive. Uh, so uh, there, is a, there, is a, there is a necessity to change that before, maybe years ago, it was a necessity, but now, especially after COVID and this uh, material uh, scarcity and the prices we are seeing right now on everything, including labor, it is now the necessity to change. The companies are ripe and they're waiting uh, and wanting to change. It's no longer only some researchers saying it. Um, so, uh, at DART, uh, we develop computational uh, robotics and additive technologies, um, as well as the strategies to basically help in a few things. One, automating design to construction, increasing construction speed, um, and then minimizing material consumption in a building, minimizing the construction industry's CO2 emission or CO2 footprint, also enabling for uh, zero waste construction through recycling or biodegradable circular economy. Um, so um, one of the technologies uh, which is kind of a game changer in this process and would help us to achieve those uh, objective or goals that I just mentioned is 3D printing. Um, it will dramatically change the way we would design and we would build in future. Uh, here, you are basically dealing directly with the raw material. It will disrupt the way material distribution in our industry would be. It would disrupt the way we will build. It will disrupt the way we will design parts as designer. Um, we, are, uh, we are basically informing raw material in a high resolution. Um, I'm assuming, do, are, 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 have your students worked with 3D printing, so they're aware of 3D yeah, printing? Yeah, so our, our, our course is completely based on additive manufacturing, so they're, they've been exploring not only outside of this course, they're pretty familiar with pretty standard ways of 3D printing, but inside oh. this course we're exploring sort of more novel or non-standard ways of 3D printing. All right, thank you. So. Yeah, so uh, with this technology, 3D printing, which you are apparently very familiar with as well, we have the opportunity to rethink our buildings, uh, our elements. Uh, a building has been always this great assembly of elements. Uh, these elements has evolved throughout time in relation to technological um, and uh, in relation to economical uh, and social changes we had. Uh, we may no longer need to rely on planner and pure extruded elements to build. What does it mean to build three-dimensional elements? What does it mean to actually be able to build way bigger than what we used to do, or maybe build on site in full? Um, what kind of disruption that may bring to our industry? So um, going back to architecture rather, uh, with 3D printing, um, I believe we have this opportunity to be in control of our elements in a different level. Um, we can control the surface, the thickness, the way, and even the inner feature, uh, and to really activate these inner features for some sort of function. Now, that being integration of existing functions, such as building services, or introducing new performances to the building through this uh, capacity that we have. Um, it's also, as I said, uh, instead of 
building one element, we may actually start looking at how to build the entire building and what does that really mean. Um, yeah, so what you see here is a technology that initially uh, we've used to start exploring 3D printing. It is the largest industrial 3D printer uh, in the world. I mean, so far, obviously, 3D printing can be as large as you wish uh, that uses binder jetting technology. Um, so what happens here, the binder jetting uh, binds a sand layer by layer. Uh, but what it means, it means that you can print complex part at the resolution of grains of sand, and in usually 24 hours with the dimension you see here. Uh, no matter how complex these parts are. Um, so if, let's see if this video play, uh, it, yeah, yeah. So here you see how it works basically. Uh, the dark green is where the sand is bound and it doesn't matter if you print a box or a complex uh, form. Printing is really quick, no matter what your form is. Um, so we use this technology to 3D print sandstone mold uh, for casting lightweight aluminum joints. Uh, in order to rather investigate its potential for mass customization um, and precision, right? Um, it, it, it took us basically uh, only four days to print molds for 182 joints. Uh, so it was really about understanding, can you do mass customization and with what the speed, what precision you can achieve such. Um, so um, with, the, uh, with, uh, with 3D printing, I always say computation is key, like any other technology. Uh, with computational design, we uh, could design these 182 one-of-a-kind lightweight joints. We could automatically generate molds with all detailing necessary for the casting of these joints. We do not want that in manual action. It's going to take you forever, basically. It really is really um, the computational methods and the technology that we developed that allows us to unfold this potential, the potential of 3D printing. Otherwise, uh, what is 3D printing is as stupid as a design is, right? Like any other machine. Um, I cannot really, this is a video, but I can't play it because every time I intend that to play it on Zoom, it hangs. It's, it's a very nice video of the entire process of how we casted these joints. Uh, to give you an idea, here we are casting 40 joints at the same time. Uh, the printed molds are packed together, the ones that you just saw the model, and then you have this um, uh, channel, like a large river that would then distribute through smaller channel. Uh, and it would distribute the aluminum to this uh, cavity for casting. Um, and if I may say, we've we failed a lot until we learned to be successful. It was coming out of prototyping and uh, through a lot of uh, iteration of computational model in relation to the prototypes that we had. Are, are the same casts reusable at all? Uh, the same cast or the same formwork, the mold? Um, both. Could you cast multiple things out of the same form? Or so, could, the, could that sand be sort of ground back up and reused? In this case that we've done, you couldn't. Uh, no, actually not. Uh, the Well, the binder jet uh, sand casting has binder in it. So reusing it is not that easy. Even, even the other sand that you see around the brown one, which usually gets binded, you can really reuse it after you cast in it. Uh, so there are research right now when we were at ETH that were working on how to reuse the binder jetting. You can do it. There is the cost into doing it. So therefore, mm -hmm. it's not yet economical to do it. Mm -hmm. um, so in this case, we throw it out. We are not reusing, not for aluminum casting. Um, it's not reused, but you can reuse it. It is not an impossible action. Rather, it's an economical and a bit of technical development that needs to go right there. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, um, right. 
So the result is a space frame structure, uh, as I said, made from 182 individual different cast joints and off the shelf rods. Um, because of the precision, uh, assembly was fast. It's That's why assembly was fast. It was the precision of the joints we achieved. It looked less than, it took basically less than four days to assemble the structure and also less than four days to produce this 180 joints. So about two weeks, I would say. Um, and uh, uh, it stands for 16 and a half feet. Uh, uh, that's quite high um, and it covers 1000 square feet of an area. It's almost as big as a bungalow, uh, basically. Um, so um, to conclude this project, this section, uh, what to me is unique about them uh, is that they are irregular and uh, they are all an optimization on their own. Uh, they are each an architecture on their own, and um, they are highly precise, and uh, they did not take long to produce. Uh, to me, combining a 3D printing with computation could basically avoid error. It could help you increase precision, reduce costs, and even introduce new static to architecture. All of that, um, but not not without computation. I don't think you could achieve what we've done without developing a computational method and techniques that would help you to do so. Um, so um, let's go back to our original goal of sustainability. Um, let me show you how computation uh, enables us to design, for example, for material reduction and waste-free construction. Um, what you see here uh, on the left um, is a diagram of a stress line in a human femur bone, uh, the, the force pattern basically. On the right side is a cross section of human femur, uh, which shows the distribution of bone tissue where stresses are. Um, can be designed structures that are optimized just like the bone and distribute material only where it's needed. Um, that is a question um, I would ask, sorry, uh, when designing uh, anything, basically, not only slab, but slab is an interesting area of research, um, especially for material reduction, because uh, concrete slab usually accounts for 85% of a building's total self weight. Um, resulting in a heavier um, foundation and higher carbon footprint uh, from the concrete uh, consumption. Uh, we don't necessarily need this much concrete. They, the only reason we are using this much concrete is basically uh, the formwork. In a, in a standard construction, uh, formwork is usually account for 44% of concrete uh, construction costs. Um, for non-standard, um, for non-standard elements, it's even more. It's about seventy percent of the resources that goes for handcrafting timber uh, of the formwork system and assembling it together and cutting it and so. So it's cheaper to use more concrete. It was so far, at least, than building formwork for optimal uh, for optimal forms. So the rip floor slab is known to reduce the concrete consumption pretty much, and it's not a new system. Uh, Nervi, Gatti, uh, Nervi did it in a Gatti wool factory in Rome. Uh, this picture or this project goes back all the way to 1951. Um, they also, uh, obviously, at a time, uh, they did not have the computational tools uh, to produce their uh, design. Uh, models. So what you see is this um, hand sketching and the, uh, the drawing that represents the idea or represents how these rib system should work together. So at DART, uh, we developed a computational software, uh, let's see if it works, uh, that would, okay, here, uh, we developed a computational software that would um, help you automatically generate a stress line as uh, we design and locate support of this lab. We automate the system uh, so, well, it jumped somehow. We automate the system 
Uh, so you can automatically translate this stress line to mesh geometry, which is the more complex part of it, and to make sure that you can automatically translate them to ribs, as the number of stress lines is way more than uh, what you need for actual rib structure. So you have to go optimal them, regenerate the rib layout, and from there uh, you get this 3D um, slab so you, from the from the stress line to here it would take any designer basically one minute less it's just generating it uh, it's a tool that would help designers to rather than getting involved into algorithm and trying to always making sure these stress lines are translated to rib would help them to um, to explore the rib layout with moving their support system being a vertical column or non-vertical elements or walls and so. Uh, so what you see here is a section drawing of one of the slab in which you can parametrically modify also the rib thickness afterwards, um, which happens quite often when your structural engineer would say, well, this is not enough thickness. You need more of it. And a structural, uh, based on the structural load that you would uh, you would have in your structure. Um, and before uh, in ETH, we even use other methods such as uh, topology optimization using existing software, such as Abacus ANSYS. You can use those, uh, those uh, software to generate optimal form, uh, or in another word, you can do topology optimization uh, for an optimal form of a slab. Uh, in this case, is a slab with four supports. So here, uh, if we were going to build this lab, obviously we couldn't have done uh, without 3D printing. Just the form of it wouldn't have allowed it. Um, uh, you can only fabricate it um, with 3D printing. Uh, we 3D printed the formwork, um, which is the white thing, and casted high-performance fiber reinforced concrete. Uh, here we are only using 50 liter of concrete. Uh, to give you an idea, a solid concrete slab um, with the same bounding dimension. Uh, if you were going to fill it up completely, it would use 270 liter of concrete. So we reduced the concrete consumption by 80%. And also uh, the way uh, is only 120 kilogram instead of being 650 kilogram. So um, yeah, that way you can that way you can imagine or uh, re relate it to to um, to how how different it is when designing a resource saving structure. The key objective is optimization. Um, but also uh, basic optimization of material and distributing them where you really have to. Uh, but building is also a multi-criteria and uh, we can't just optimize it. it optimization is convergence to one point. Uh, we need to basically design our de design tools or at least um, uh, computational design tools that would allow us to explore design while optimizing, but doesn't necessarily converge toward optimization. Um, so that would lead us to the next project, which is more of a real world um, slab project. Uh, Romania? Yes. For that last one, was the did the formwork stay in place? Yes. So with that last one, it's a sandstone formwork, the, gray, the green one that you guys saw. We just painted it white afterward. Mm -hmm. And then we casted uh, the, the uh, high performance fiber reinforced concrete and we left it there. And we've done also tests to fire resist, uh, fire, um, uh, fi uh, fire uh, test and uh, with Germany to see uh, what would happen in the, in the case of fire with the sand uh, fall uh, way earlier than concrete or how long does the, does the sand uh, bond with this concrete also. Uh, that was one of the key things because smart slab initially was going to be um, stay in place sand work, but we didn't have um, comprehensive tests to ensure that if in case of fire, these sands would not literally fall on people's head. So we started rethinking also how to use the sandstone formwork for uh, concrete. Was that mm -hmm. right? Um, okay. So um, yeah, the next project that um, 
I like to share here is the smart slab uh, where we developed a lightweight slab from 3D printing formwork, but also through computation, ecology of uh, computational uh, design. Uh, I led this pro project in uh, Switzerland. It involved many collaboration in academia as well as in industry. So uh, it also uh, was a collaboration between different investigators who uh, were running the chairs, uh, which are right down there, the professorship. Um, and uh, to understand uh, all these companies that are listed here who collaborated, they are also uh, play they play an important role in in the industry or construction industry or. Uh, the moving forward of industries, different industries in uh, Switzerland. Uh, this is a lot of partner and um, and that shows also an interest from the industry. If, if you want to get this project somewhere, you need to have industrial partner to make it, to transfer the knowledge and make it also realistic. Um, so the context is, uh, is unit, uh, uh, the, the, like, it's a unit that would be on this um, uh, structure. Basically, this is a uh, the, the unit is called DFAP House, and uh, this is structure basically hosts multiple projects uh, that would plug into it, and it acts as a bone structures for research. So every of those units there are containing some sort of research, and they would either stay there for a long time or there would be there for five to six years, uh, depending to the project. Um, our slab was standing on the last floor. Um, so uh, now going to the unit itself, which is the DFAB house, uh, is, um, uh, it, which was also, as I said, collaboration between different chair, which also means collaboration between different elements here. Uh, you would have um, yeah, our slab basically was sandwiched between the two floor, uh, the robotically timber structure that is right up there, and down the S-shaped wall. And then you see these um, uh, mullions at the facade uh, right below the below the slab. Uh, and those mullions weren't taking load; they're just there uh, to transfer the wind load to the slab and to, to the other slab, basically. So um, this is lab project is uh, some way intended to redefine architects territory. Um, everyone looks at it more as a as an optimization process, but really uh, beside material comes consumption, a challenge with the slab is the amount of building services that are uh, often added to a slab. Um, which reduces our use, usability of a space. Uh, we have that problem right now, how to densify uh, in, in the next 80 years. And uh, this is a ceiling installation by Rem Kulhas uh, for, uh, I think, 2014 Biennale, uh, where he says, the ceiling element uh, has turned to a sick uh, volume with machinery. Uh, now, excuse me if I miss some of this uh, <laughs> exact uh, uh, wording. And uh, where the architect has um, nothing to say, has no interest. It is a place for technician. And um, more and more uh, architects are losing interest and control over this territory. And that's why it becomes even more interesting and even more challenging for us today uh, as architects to rethink this uh, building element. Uh, why should we actually lose control and why should we not be interested when we can be interested with the technology, when the technology can uh, bring us to a new territory that we lost uh, control over or interest even over. Uh, so with Smart Lab, we wanted to create uh, this um, ultra lightweight, but also a super condensed uh, slab that uses minimal material, integrate building services, um, and uh, have a new static that expresses uh, 3D printing all at once. And uh, this is a this is a early a rendering of this lab. Uh, uh, which kind of visualize it. It's about uh, 78 square meter. Uh, uh, that's about um, 840 square foot. And uh, it rests on a central S-shaped uh, wall. 
it can deliver uh, to the facade uh, and it supports a two story, the timber story above it. It also receives, as I said, wind load from the facade uh, mullion. So it's not resting on those mullion, but it's actually um, just uh, taking the load from the wind. Uh, it's made of uh, 11 prefabricated concrete segments um, that would be connected on site through post tensioning. Uh, you prefabricate them, you take it to the side and post tension it. Um, this is it's a structural system that would uh, that allows it to be minimal. It's made of rig system in two direction and a thin shell in between uh, of this uh, rib structure. Um, this is probably a better uh, uh, section of the section drawing of the slab where you can see it's not only reducing the overall way of the slab, but also providing space for building services such as like a sprinkler or uh, electrical installation and uh, the plumbing system. So it's all, it's, it's the space you could use rather than go add it on the ceiling later. Um, this is a, a, a layout that we generated. I wonder if this video would actually play. Yeah, uh, based on the uh, load, uh, the uh, the optimal load that would uh, come from the up floor, and then uh, how this load had to be distributed in certain point and connect to the wall. So we basically had to mediate between all of these. Uh, uh, scenarios, how the S-shaped wall is changing at all time and how the load coming. So we had to have a model, a confessional model to constantly constantly adapt to these two changes. The, the wall below was under research. The, for, uh, the building above us was under research at all time. Nothing was constant. Everything was in move. And we didn't want to design these ribs all the time at all set moments. So we had to kind of like make a system where they always intersect in certain way. Um, so that was a parametric model that we had to help us kind of uh, uh, generate the layout only, the rib layout. And then uh, we developed another uh, parametric model, which I, I it rather was for communication with the contractors and people in the in the in the business. Uh, that would allow us to optimize the, the form and uh, help us to understand how much material we are using because at all time we would be asked how much concrete are you using, how light is it, how heavy it is for the overall load of the building and also for the structural engineers. So there was one model there. There was another model from which we actually generated everything. It was more comprehensive model uh, where we analyzed and generated the and data, uh, data for fabrication, we generated the overall form, but also all the details for the formwork came from this model, uh, the segmentation of the formwork, the, uh, the uh, detailing, the data that you needed to put the formwork together all came from this particular model. Um, so, um, the fabrication of the slab itself is uh, it is also involved many strategic uh, combination of manufacturing techniques. Um, you see uh, from top to bottom, you have CNC laser cutting of the plywood form uh, formwork. You have CNC bending of rebars, um, which every rebar set was different, so you had to basically CNC bend them and then place them in the formwork. And then it was also the spraying and casting, the combination of the two for the actual slab. And then you have at the bottom the 3D printed uh, sandwork. It's actually, I sometimes feel guilty to call it a 3D printed uh, project because it's more of a hybrid of everything to make it happen rather than just uh, a 3D printing. But the 3D printing enabled a more um, lightweight probably and uh, the ability that anything could come to it because it's just so free uh, but everything else so as well um so uh it's almost like a um, um that like what, what you see here is like basically a segment uh, of one uh, one of those uh, um, uh, slab sections uh, and uh, it's like a puzzle it's like a puzzle that parts should come together perfectly because as soon as something is not there, there's a leakage of concrete and that's where you will have problem. You have to precisely put these parts together 
uh, to make sure every segment of the of the uh, wall uh, slab will come together in precision that we wanted. So more than anything, I think it's the art of design, the formwork when you deal with with concrete rather than it's all with casting actually metal. If you ever are doing it, it's you will realize that you're designing more formwork than you're designing the object. And that's a quite an engineering on its own. There is a machine, this entire thing is a machine itself, how to cast and how to assemble this thing. So there's no leakage both in both cases, but there's a different kind of leakage. And how to make sure a, a curing is, uh, or settling, settling of concrete, setting of concrete is happening in a uh, in a, a way that the bonding is occurring right between the the beam and the and the sprayed uh, shell. So uh, what you see here is the 3D printed formwork for each segment, each of these segments. Um, Manu, so, were, were the were the utilities cast in place from that last picture? Or is so that just showing here, where they go? Yeah, yeah. What you see here, good question. What you see here is actually we placed, made a placeholder for everything, yeah. uh, so that you don't, uh, you you know, in an actual construction concrete, if you are in a ten floor or a thirty floor high rise, which I've worked on before, when you do slab, they come and place something in the ceiling uh, for a vertical pipes or anything that goes vertical. But this one only a placeholder, and afterward they would just remove it and then place something. But these are done manually in the formwork. Someone will come in and then do this while somebody is assembling the formwork on the construction site. So we've done exactly the same, but we just 3D printed our parts. And then we place them in advance in our prefabrication. If this was not done this way, you should have called the electrician, then you should have called the plumber while the formwork uh, person was putting the formwork together, come drill the thing where they want to, or based on their drawing. And this itself delayed the project pretty much in real world, mm. at least. And here, um, yeah, those are placeholder, except, uh, do you see the red one, which mm -hmm. has two arrow? Uh, those are post-tensioning pipe. So they stayed in place and they were not placeholder. Uh, they were there uh, to basically later send in the post-tensioning cable through them. Uh, so yeah, uh, the, the purple one was a placeholder uh, and it was not the entire thing that was there. It was just, you, you see the pipe, but it's only that the, the intersection with the wood that would actually be part of the formwork. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, yeah, so here, uh, what was it? It's a 3D printed uh, segments of each, uh, 3D printed you know, formwork for each segment. And um, each of them uh, are uh, made of multiple 3D printed formwork. So that's why there are different color for basically uh, visualizing that there are not one entire segment. Uh, there is uh, 181 3D printed parts which are automatically generated using the surface model that I showed you at the at the uh, last of the models. Uh, then um, here you see uh, that the detailing also was generated automatically as part of this formwork between all the parts. We didn't have to then do that manually. It comes back to computational techniques that you need to develop. And then uh, here you see the loose sand, uh, which was then removed. And it also gives you an idea of the scale of this piece. Because once I said a small piece, someone asked me, what's a small? Because they they were thinking that's, uh, that's a small piece, for example, that we had for the, for the, for the formwork. And then uh, here you see the parts, the printed parts that were going to be moved to where they were assembled and then used for spraying and casting. So, um, yeah, so here you uh, see the assembly and obviously you don't see the seams anymore because uh, our, our concrete expert was uh, working with the surface uh, and coding it multiple times, ensuring that there is no line of these segments coming together. Um, here you would see the spraying of glass fiber reinforced concrete uh, on top of the 3D printed formwork, which then allows for lightweight uh, shell. It's a, GF, a GFRC, which is quite known for being very lightweight. Um, so once concrete is cured, then uh, segments are 
transported on a site. So one thing you didn't see here, which I wish I would have added, is after this, the, right as soon as this is spread, the timber is placed uh, onto this and then the cast occurs. And that's, an, that's a very quick process because you don't want the bond between the cast part and the spray parts to be uh, to be cold joint, basically, or, or yeah, they call it cold joint in the industry. Um, so that's so the, the spray part is just that thin shell? Yes. And the, so and the, the cast part is the, the vertical? Right. So the spray part is the thin shell you see here. And then as soon as you spray all the, all the, I wish I had the, uh, I have probably, I have it at the end of this uh, presentation somewhere. Oops, sorry. Um, um, yeah. So um, the, the, the timber structure then comes right onto this with all the things integrated into it, like the rebars. And so it's already there. They're, they're made in advance prior to prior to assembly. You don't want to have any delay here. You put it on and you immediately cast the concrete uh, at the at the core, which is top. Uh, and that's because you don't want the cast part and the surface to have a uh, to have a cold bond. You want to mm -hmm. do this as soon as possible. Um, so that's one. And then you would see here all the holes that you just asked about if they were there or they were placeholder. Most of them were placeholder, except the ones that the pipes are still there, which are right into the ribs of the slab. Um, so then they were taken uh, to the site uh, and uh, lifted uh, to be assembled. The result is a lightweight concrete slab with only 20 millimeter uh, at most part, uh, less than an inch, 20 millimeter, I think. And then um, the void, uh, which were designed for integration of building services was working pretty well. And um, the uh, ribs was also taking the load it has to take. Uh, this is how it looked. Uh, and now we didn't then have to wait for 100 uh, of these uh, trades to come in different time. They just come into the site and install services very quickly in the hole that previously pre-planned, prefabricated, and came as part of the slab. So that that section was quite fast. And then this is an interior view of the slab, which I, you wouldn't really see how light it is. It actually looks quite massive in some way. And uh, here you see the resolution uh, of concrete. Uh, you can see that we reach the limit of what we can do with concrete. If you've worked with concrete before, you would know how fragile this thing is. And, uh, it's very filigree concrete detailing that we had here in terms of depth and uh, also how thin it is. Um, so uh, uh, the slab as uh, for part of this uh, DFAP house uh, was finished and this is a <laughs> exterior view. Uh, I just want to conclude probably this project with, well, I have another slide of conclusion, but I just want to say um, th this, this, project was really a pain sometimes because of the mediation it had to do with all these things. It was just between top and bottom and the side. And there were so much changes in the process that uh, I think if we didn't really at some point develop this model that we had, we would have to withdraw this slab more than any, I mean, we would have been hating it. We did hate it at some point. So. <laughs> That, that computational model was quite useful, but it did not come the day, day one. It came like way in the middle when we had the concept in place. You know, we knew that it was two side ribs versus one side rib and so on and so um, So to uh, conclude this project, uh, um, we achieved over 60% concrete reduction through form optimization. We achieved high surface quality. Uh, we have a high precision between our concrete element. We achieve a free-form slab, uh, a best focus slab from uh, one of a kind segment. Uh, and then integral computation to actually coordinate a puzzle of uh, over 2,000 different parts. And uh, I, rather than integral computation, sometimes like to call it ecology of computation. Um, then uh, also combining different techniques where it fits fast, best. So I, I, I don't personally believe in mono uh, mono construction or mono anything. I just think 
sometimes you need to just choose the best uh, for the project and you have to be capable to um, kind of extract those techniques and put them together if one doesn't fit alone. Um, so with while we are in concrete, I wanted to also show you another project, which is less probably seen uh, uh, around, uh, which also was uh, when I came here and then it was a collaboration between now uh, my team and where I used to work at DBT. It's on 3D printing uh, ultra lightweight GFRC facade panel and um, uh, really continuing on the on the smart slab, but going uh, to building envelope system here. And, uh, again, building envelope is also interesting. Uh, you can still reduce concrete construct, uh, consumption in it, what you see are the prefabricated Cadet concrete elements, and that's usually how it come to the building uh, prefabricated. A lighter facade system in general can reduce the overall weight of a building as well, and uh, will reduce the overall weight of the support that you need in the basement. But more than that, easier transportation and handling on site. Also, transportation. I don't know if you've noticed in our earlier uh, part of my diagram. You see transportation also contribute in construction to the CO2 emission. So more compact, lighter, it's all together. It's, it helps uh, in this uh, achieving what we are aiming to achieve. So uh, to further minimize this uh, material consumption, we look into minimal surfaces. Uh, one of my favorite, um, um, uh, like um, how do I call it? I don't want to say geometry or by geometrical understanding of the world. Uh, these surfaces have a minimized total surface area uh, for a given boundary. And uh, using this mathematical geometry, uh, we can place material uh, where we want. Uh, so, um, for example, I heard sometimes uh, Philip saying strength through geometry um, for the form that he's using through tension. And I think that's an amazing way of putting it, a strength through geometry, uh, using geometries that uh, give you uh, strength. So in mathematics, these forms are described through such equation. And uh, sometimes these are not the best equation to explore uh, or use it for design exploration. So we also develop design tools um, um, uh, that would allow you to do to explore and alter the mathematical surface. I can't show that right now as you are recording because it's getting into a, a, a publication, but afterward, when we finish recording, I could show the actual, um, a bit more of the, how it works. Um, I, I think uh, it's to me very significant that today uh, we can not only uh, build these things, but we can model them, we can visualize them, we can then bring them to the real world and scale them up and maybe something new comes out of these forms we were unfamiliar with. Um, so here you see that we uh, we kind of designed the reusable double-sided 3D printed formwork. In this case for concrete, you can reuse sandstone formwork multiple times. And that was the idea because in the other projects we haven't reused it. And then we never used double sided because again, concrete, as soon as you cast it, there's air bubble and every way you cast is a new way, it's a new research. And uh, we wanted to do this double sided 3D printed formwork with sand. And uh, the result is what you see right here. Uh, and uh, again, due to this high precision you can achieve with 3D printing, I don't know how much you know about these uh, minimal surfaces, but they have this fundamental region that it kind of repeats through the entire form. But um, if you're not precise, they cannot connect on the edge, they just can't. And the precision of the, the, the fabrication process, and really thanks to 3D printing here, um, these parts were assembled in uh, less than a few hours. That's kind of, uh, um, to me, uh, that I work with concrete and also me most of us for a long time, I think it's a, it's a very high achievement. And then um, here you can see it stands two meter high uh, and it is only 80 millimeter thick this time. Uh, it's uh, only fi uh, glass fiber and, uh, and concrete. It's a it's white concrete. It uses um, about 80 liter uh, of concrete. That's 40 per unit uh, of GFRC is used. And uh, again, um, 
because of accuracy, the 32 parts came together with less than a millimeter uh, precision at their interface, uh, intersection and interface. So um, concluding this project, uh, which I sometimes think is, was more of a geometric morphing in a macro and micro scale, uh, we managed to achieve um, a free form ultra lightweight facade uh, for or from repetitive elements, uh, while at the same time minimizing minimizing the formwork waste um, by uh, reusing the formwork, uh, but also um, enabling production of something that it doesn't look as repetitive as we uh, as we could be. Um, and then we also achieve a high surface quality here, resolution of about 0.2 millimeter high precision between the cast part, way higher than smart slab, in this case was less than a millimeter. And um, fabrication was also highly detailed in microstructure, which I think in future could function as an activation of some sort for um, saving energy or CO2 when you have the way to fabricate them, if there's a material that by um, maximizing its detailing, you could do something with an environment then at least the technology is there to use. And uh, that's what I'm envisioning, that this detailing would allow you to do something with your with your exterior environment. Um, so, so is that made with just that one double-sided, like all of them the same, or were they individually cast no, with different? Well, they are individually casted. So every piece is individually casted, but you need four formwork because of the mirroring. The, okay. uh, yeah, not two, but four. Formwork, but with the form formwork, you could basically uh, go all the way and cast the entire 32 parts, if that makes sense. Because there's two yeah. that in reality, it's two, it's two and two mirroring in Rhino, yeah. and that becomes four in the physical world formwork. Because and since it's, is, since it's periodic, it repeats, and so you can use yes, it. Okay. yes. So I mean, this one is repetitive. I mean, if it's not repetitive, then you have to print the entire thing. Uh, and the idea of this project was to have a reusable formwork for repetitive um, uh, uh, element. It was a collaboration with Stalton. Uh, it's a uh, it's a company that works a lot now with concrete and facade as well for a long time. But uh, they collaborated on this project and have a lot of nice parts in their office, which is flat, actually. They're not freeform like the one we have producing mm -hmm. this technology that we developed together. Um, so the last project or the last sets of projects that I want to go through, it's a robotic 3D printing of uh, polymer. Uh, for building envelope solution that are net zero energy building. This is a collaboration uh, between myself and uh, Professor Wes Mackey at uh, Topman. Uh, so here in this project, uh, well, before we get there, let's actually uh, talk about plastic. <laughs> plastic are cheap uh, and are very lightweight. I didn't like them before. I started liking them now. Uh, they're versatile, durable. Uh, they're easy to maintain and recyclable. And that's why I started liking them. Uh, the existing research in biodegradable, um, renewable, um, and uh, recyclable uh, plastic uh, are, are turning the way we are looking at plastic right now. Uh, it allows it to be a life cycle material and a, be part of circular economy. So we thought of uh, rethinking plastic and reusing it as a, as a material that we can build with and then we can reuse over uh, when the lifetime of a building element is finished. And again, there are not many material that is as light and versatile and uh, weather resistance as plastic is. Um, so here uh, you can see uh, how we can print it plastic uh, for the building and env building envelope. This is a pellet extruder that we developed at Topman. And we have a, a pellet rather than filament uh, to basically uh, print parts. It was a student project initially, uh, but then we extended it later for more. Um, so uh, this video somehow stopped playing for some reason constantly. So we developed uh, also optimization method that would allow you to 
and generate ultra lightweight facade, but also where the stresses are going to be if you are going to cast concrete or going to cast um, uh, 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 carbon fiber in these pipes. But these were where the loads of the facade would go. And this in between where this minimal surface, as a matter of fact, generated from those lines that uh, uh, that would allow uh, a thin shell, but it was double uh, or had, um, it was laminate, it's with a void in between or double to cast, um, to cast aerogel or a PCM throughout the to uh, to to uh, to allow for a more environmental building envelope. And uh, here you would see the fabrication process, which involves many branching. Uh, that was a challenge. We had to develop our own uh, tool pathing uh, and controlling system to enable for uh, branching and also cooling uh, in a way that uh, we don't deform uh, or Basically, it is not, um, uh, how would you say, it? like if it doesn't cool uh, fast and when you go back to it, then you have deformation basically. So right I'm on top or right timing of uh, cooling. Uh, so here you can see how tall and how thin we can go. And for those who has worked with a pellet extrusion, they would know that things move like this at all time when you print. So you need certain stability. And all of that was learned through this project, like how, what are the challenges when you print so large? What are the things we have to do? If you want to do thin but large, how, how can you do that? This project was really to exploit how tall and how thin we can go more than just being an envelope with pellet extrusion. And what is the precision which we can achieve? And I think we are the only university, and I think so in the world that we can achieve so far this resolution. I know it's happening in few places with pellet extrusion. I haven't seen that resolution anywhere yet. And I haven't seen anyone showing their uh, close up picture of their <laughs> high resolution 3D printer. This is right on the printer yet. I haven't, like, you see everybody right in there. <laughs> and then on the left, I have a bad version. On the right, I have a good version. For the exhibition we had, we took the bad version and the good version and we put it right in there to just show these differences. On the left side, for example, you see these lines where the robot toolpath thing, you can't send the data to robot anymore because the controller can't take more data, so you have to set it by set and how mm. that impacts but then if we develop our controller system on the right side where you continuously print kilometers no matter what, then what would be the impact in the overall form and even the transparency, translucency. So really, this is a, the final uh, uh, part, uh, which was exhibited in Cooper with the purpose of showing different resolution you can achieve here by altering the method and uh, creating innovation through this tool pathing itself and control it. Um, so that leads us to the, um, to the well, con as a continuation to the next project, which I've been working on, uh, which is multi-layer building envelope with integrated system. And now how, lesson learned from there, uh, how the 3D printing uh, could be used for a house or so to be integrated system that combines the many layer functions of a conventional floor wall system. Um, if you build house, you know that a, 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 a typical envelope would be a combination uh, or um, it would be many layers of a, a cladding, air and moisture barrier, air barrier, moisture barrier, and um, uh, and um, structural part and so so all these barriers that is for environmental like ex, uh, air barrier and moisture barrier they are also made of plastic so why not printing everything all at one set and just if we need to cast now insulation find insulation that fits best and if we want to cast foam we cast foam if we don't want to cast foam we do aerogel. Uh, so we create this integrative system with all those barriers in mind and thinking, considering those barriers. So this was that project where we wanted to really think about the actual building envelope, not the facade only, uh, that it acts as entire facade. So this is also a minimal surface uh, exploration that uh, we used it as a medium for design because these minimal surfaces, they have interior voids. 
um, that would connect uh, different topology and different spaces together. And in this case, we wanted to have, if you would see, we have uh, one, two, three voids. And these voids are one of them is uh, for insulation, one is for air. So you want to have this many layer of voids, but you still want to connect the outside and the inside where the windows are. Uh, in circle in this case, didn't have to be circle, but you have to connect these two worlds together, but you want to have the many layers and you want to print continuously, as continuous as possible, because uh, every island, it slows the process, uh, it's, uh, it has its own challenges, and here we have a lot of islands, but still we worked with it. Uh, we also introduced the um, we worked also uh, with the with the um, sorry I'm just getting emails here trying to get focus. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, yeah, diffusion algorithm in order to uh, generate the detailing, but this detailing weren't for static really. They were because as you go up, you start having instability within the thin shell. So you have to have some sort of structure uh, throughout the system. Also, because we wanted to fill in either PCM or aerogel in these two exterior voids, then uh, you couldn't just fill it in in a big volume. It would just like, poof. I mean, it just would low. Every time PCM extra, uh, expands, it would have impacted the envelope. So we kind of created this detailing that would touch the surface below and then come back and would also allow for some sort of a pipeline throughout this. And uh, here you would see how this many islands are located and then the two surfaces and the back and front. Uh, this is only our simulation for the uh, robot before printing. And uh, here you see the printed part after it's done, uh, robot is resting really. It also needed, and this was the final piece that was exhibited at uh, Cooper Union. Uh, it is uh, it is also made of two parts. One is with high resolution mesh, one with, with low resolution mesh to really again showcase what is the difference and how would that make an impact in the speed of fabrication in also the outcome you will achieve when it's uh, low res versus high, high res, uh, high res uh, uh, mesh. And this project led to uh, how, how much? My... How much does huh? the resolution of the mesh affect the um, the print time, or is it more the resolution of the print time that affects it? It just affected the heaviness of the file before we generated huh. the tool pad. Uh, so uh, at the end, well, it did matter. The higher resolution one took a slightly longer. But more than the fabrication, in a sense of fabricating, it impacted the time we took to generate the fabrication data, basically, the mm -hmm. toolpath. Mm -hmm. The lower resolution one was much faster to generate toolpaths, and the other one, it took a bit of a time to generate toolpaths for every, it, it was only a whole toolpath set. So uh, the low res was much quicker. You had to wait for the computer to sync probably for half to one hour. The other one, sometimes it crashed. Uh, so, but then finally we managed, you know, to, it was more the data generation than the actual fabrication time itself, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, um, going forward, it led to a project with uh, three of my, four of my students, which now we are working on it further as a research. Uh, it's uh, how to use this technology to uh, decrease the heat island effect in uh, in cities. Uh, heat island uh, is uh, is the effect that we've seen in urban context uh, because of the asphalt facade of the building. The uh, heat in the city increased, um, and then that impact the climate. Also, because we will urbanize further and we'll have more people in the city, it impacts the health of the people beyond even the climate. So it's not only about the climate with no human as part of it. Um, so this project is really like exploring how to integrate uh, biodiverse 
or enabled biodiversity through building and develop. On the left, you see the 3D printed part. On the right, you see the complexity of this envelope where um, different uh, pods uh, size are integrated into an envelope system. Uh, so the design software would allow anybody who wants to, let's say, future buy this facade based on different uh, plant dimension uh, diversifies these holes. And these holes would automatically adjust. Uh, they are connected in terms of size that is given would automatically provide you with the, with the size you need for your root. Um, the, the, my my students didn't manage to put nice plants into the left side, but they try to express that it's not for one plant. It's meant for biodiversity, and that's uh, that means different size of root, and that means different size of the pot, and that's what they wanted to achieve. And these pots are fed uh, by the uh, soil, uh, the water from the soil, and the layer below it. They did not want to have a mechanical system that would fit this uh, and uh, they wanted this to be more natural, uh, low maintenance and there is system in place of how to water the sand in different floors so that you don't have to have a high mechanical system for it. Um, and really, if you look at the section while it's printing from top, then you would see the complexity. It is like how these pods are going back to one layer. And again, uh, another problem with green envelope has been that how do you create a separation from, there was always a separate green envelope and there was building envelope. Uh, and you wanted to make sure the water doesn't get to the building, so there is no mold or anything. Here, uh, plastic, it just gives it to you. It's inherent into plastic, doesn't let things to just go from one side to another. So we took advantage of this and then uh, uh, designed this many layer. The many layer at the back are the many layer you need to have insulation just by air, and then you don't use anything else. So air is a great insulation. Uh, but you need to have many, many layers of air in the thin, uh, with a small gap between them. So that's what this project was showcasing. High insulation, thermal insulation without any thermal material. And uh, we also had a colleague of us who is an environmental scientist and does a lot of calculation on um, uh, our values, uh, telling us how many layers we would need. This is not the exact layer you need. You need another 10 layers right below it. It just, the students didn't have time to print such a big thing with that many layers. So they kind of reduced it to uh, this number right now uh, to showcase this, the capacity of it. So with that, I, I mean, this is my last slide. I, I think I could just finish here. Many, many of our uh, recent uh, work has been on robotic um, 3D printing of polymer, um, carbon fiber, uh, looking at generating multi-layer uh, and fully recyclable building uh, envelope. Uh, the the multi-layer will provide for integration of performances, and I'm hoping uh, for a thermal control that would not need too many devices, nor need too many unhealthy um, material for installation. So this is an ongoing research at the at the lab, and it's uh, going along with other concrete work that we are doing, and we are just expanding in in terms of uh, what is next, what is it we are developing, and uh, what new material we want to look at. But again, we always whatever we look at, we always go back and. We built on our cyber physical system, uh, which is our, which is our, I would call it a computational model network that is expanding as you know as the team grows. Uh, so with that, I would say thank you. And if you have any question, um, please go ahead. If you haven't slept all the time that I was talking. <laughs> no, that was that was great. It was super interesting to me. Um, some of these, some of these large um, polymer prints, like are actually some of the largest prints I've I, I've seen, and they're continuous. Mm -hmm. What what are the print times like on some of these things? Um, so the panel that you saw for the Cooper, uh, not the not the one that you saw from front, the larger one from the left, uh, took forty two hours. The one right be behind me, with this has a lot of branching. Don't forget branching mm -hmm. takes a lot of time. If you mm -hmm. were not branching, that would be different. So this also took about 
40, 38 hours basically behind me. And it's uh, a bit more than two meter. And uh, it's as wide as uh, 140 meter. And the thickness, you can just say it's just, it's, this is very thin, but it's really like more how many islands you would have because mm -hmm. it has to traverse between the island. It has to lead in and lead out. And then we have, because we want to have this resolution and not see mm -hmm. how leading and lead out um, uh, like affect the surface, we have uh, to go around. And then also the way we lead in and lead out slows the process itself. It slows the nozzle movement. And then mm -hmm. we make sure there is no material once you are getting up to Travis to the other island. Uh, so. We are still working on speeding uh, way more on that, but that's about the speed we have. And uh, we can go faster. We didn't because these were exhibition pieces and uh, we had to just finish it. We, it was too risky to go faster. I, uh, we have another piece being printed. Well, our extruder is broken just now. I mean, two weeks ago, West students have managed to break the extruder into the bed. I don't know how that has happened, but mm. they kind of went to the bed and the whole um, screw inside it is half now. Oh. So we have to build a new extruder. Um, and that will take some time. But the test we were going to do in summer, I wanted to push the full speed and go up as much as possible to see how bad it can be. With the four, we printed a formwork I haven't shown in this project, which is a part of Acadia, last year Acadia. The formwork that, that we printed was larger than this. Mm. And it's from carbon, uh, uh, not a continuous, but short carbon uh, mm -hmm. pellet. And they, uh, that was way faster. Uh, carbon is, it cools much faster. It also doesn't deform as much. Uh, so the precision was very high. That was, um, that was even 37 six hours for the size that it was bigger than this for these uh, for these multi-day prints are you does it need yeah. to happen continuously or yeah. are you able to increment that oh no 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 we don't stop because if you stop you saw what happened with the lines in yeah between. yeah obviously that's a that's a thing to think about right because you can't print the entire building with plastic or eventually you have to say this is my max size and then there will be a joint mm -hmm. but we want the max size to be at least as high as the robot reach mm -hmm. and as wide as the bed reach right now. I wish the bed was wider, mm, but uh, um, we don't stop. Uh, we have a system because of COVID, uh, we made this um, camera system so we can be home and actually control as well. Uh, so if something happens, we can stop the robot and send someone into the lab uh like during the night or so nobody really stays there we can't i mean it's it's brutal to have students we for one of the exhibition i had students changing and sitting there but that was not our researchers this was like a gsi master students who wanted to have some extra money they sat there and did their assignment at night but they weren't doing nothing the only thing we, they would do is if something happened they would call us and we would go on this camera and then we would see what's going on and we would stop. We would do everything from home, basically, <laughs> if needed. But uh, just the human attention, but let's say, or uh, cautious consciousness, because our camera doesn't have yet a consciousness, so it doesn't yeah. know if something is on error. We can see, but what if I'm sleeping? Who would know if it's printing in air and just material or coming down? That's why we had them. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, it had to be printed continuously. If you stop and you want to print on top of it again, that's a problem. You will have delamination. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Hmm. Well, um, what what do you see are the um, either the the next steps or the maybe the limitations to implementing this more into the building industry? The polymer printing? Or any of the research that you're looking at. I mean, I know the um, the concrete has made its way into a lot of full-scale projects, so that, one's, that one seems relatively sort of ripe for industry uh, adoption. Some of the polymer printing seems still a little nascent, but has opportunities. What do you, what do you think the limitations are for getting that more implemented? Is it, is it the sort of 
um, a, bu- a bureaucracy of the industry? Is it codes? Is it acceptance from construction workers? Like, what what are the the things that are limiting that right now? Okay, so I mean the politics and so on. I think eventually has to change, and mm-hmm. teams are working on it. I mean we are working at the UM now with larger groups, policy makers, and so making a bold challenges team that can talk to the government and SF and so. But uh, coming to the technical part, which I can actually fed back maybe to, uh, and I know more of. One problem I see is that if you are building an envelope system from mold inject molding, which is also from plastic you can do, you make one mold and you make hundred thousands. And if you're going to print this for every part, that's a bit of, it's more a time of printing and that everything is customized. Uh, for, for 3D printing, I mean, I love the technology and um, the only thing I'm thinking is like, well, unless every building would really be that customized, it would be a bit of drawback to do things with the printing when you can do one of it and make, in this case, for example, making a mold that you can inject mold uh, uh, an entire facade system. But the problem is you can't also inject mold such a facade system. So there's this two different barrier. One is the time you take to print. We had a company uh, approaching us to uh, build a kind of a bridge for them with this material, but not a bridge that people would walk on. Uh, But it was humongous. Like every piece was seven meter wide and four meter high. They wanted it in two months and uh, every piece. And they had like, I think 500 pieces. I can't remember something like that. And um, they wanted it in two months and uh, with a million dollar budget. I mean, I was like, okay, either increase your money so that we can get more robots or like increase your time. I mean, that that, that seems unfeasible with any technology to have that in two months. Yeah, I don't I don't even know if they managed to finish it in two months, yeah. you know? And they already had their design and they came and just, it was really, for them was time. And mm-hmm. I've been on construction side, I have a practice. So I've seen every day you lose money. So every day matters. You just want to push to get it, you get it mm-hmm. going because every, most of these projects aren't paid from pocket, they're on line of credit, mortgages or uh, investors, and every day would actually count for them if it's a month later versus mm-hmm. one day. So I would say timing, it's issue from, from technical point of view. Uh, that might be a bit of drawback. The other thing, I think 3D printing is a material thing at, at the same time. And um, Printers need to somehow be li- larger than than the than the parts. That's another drawback. I mean, I know about all these uh, ideas of having <clears throat> agent-based printing running around, and it's a great idea. Just thinking about application, uh, an agent-based uh, uh, drone or any kind of uh, uh, robots that would print um, together as a small printer couldn't probably do concrete, for example, right? So you have to see which material can be done with which technology best Mm -hmm. and try to go away from this macro or the humongous printing machine. Um, Because the printer, I mean, I I don't know any other uh, technique that the machine is way bigger than the parts um, and has to always be. But also everything else is assembly of parts. So Mm -hmm. maybe we have to rethink how we assemble with with this you know, how we define our parts when using 3D printing and now assemble. Um, so yeah, one, one drawback is this material uh, I'm printing and then if it stops, then all of the sudden you are in problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, you don't want the system to stop ever. And with kneeling, you stop and then you can continue your toolpath and just cut again, again. But here you stop and then you have a cold joint. Mm-hmm. So you can develop system to not have it. Uh, but right now it's not there. So there's so much to research sell. And um, there are obviously drawback like everything else, but there's also a lot of, I think there's so much to offer with the technology. And with concrete, um, concrete printing, for example, I just, two weeks ago, I was in a panel discussion. I don't know if you've seen it or not, uh, on Visionary Forum. Mm-hmm. And uh, there were venture capital, um, who invested into branch and other companies and uh, 
They were uh, people with 30, 40 years expertise in US in the actual construction. And when I asked, the, the venture capital asked me what, if I would print concrete uh, and why I'm not con printing concrete yet in US, I'm like, we haven't co printed concrete yet. We are we are developing a technology, but we are not printing concrete yet. I'm like, I don't know why would I print concrete really? Like, it's like everybody are printing it and there's yet not one, pro one real world project that is acceptable. Like okay. uh, we could say, no, no, from tomorrow we would do. We know the limitation. So many researchers are working on it. They haven't come with any solution. I'm not saying nobody should think about it, but maybe we have to rethink it. Maybe there's something really wrong, deeply mm -hmm. wrong in it. And they said, it's funny you say that because last year we decided we will no longer fund any concrete extrusion project um, uh, from the venture part because we also see that there's a lot of walls being built, a lot of houses being built, but the roofs come from another material and it's only compression yet it's not per code and uh it's true you don't want he said we don't want to have concrete projects falling on people's head and i'm not a person that i'm usually very optimistic but i usually say if 99 people working in the world toward a project for 10 years straight and yet they're dealing with things that doesn't solve the actual problem. Either you have to rethink the problem completely or rethink the technology. Maybe there is other way to look at it, right? Do you, so, do you think that's a limitation of um, a lot of the on-site printing versus the in, in lab or in factory printing? Because a lot of your work is sort of the prefabricated pieces that then either get installed or cast and assembled and, and um, a lot of the work that I think you're referring to is more like the sort of machines that are on site printing, you know, walls in place. Do you see that as a conceptual limitation of uh, mm -hmm. the sort of solutions that have been developed or um, are there other other limitations that you see? Well, I certainly think on, I love on-site construction, but I also see on-site limitation pretty much uh, the, from climate to go all the way to whatever else that might occur throughout your work. And I think you would have way higher precision in prefabrication in general, like better building, better precision. Mm -hmm. And all you need to do is to mediate now whatever you build. If you just mediate your baseline where you put it on, which means really connection between your ground and the rest of it, because the, 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 this if the foundation is not precise, you can still work with this, even on site is not precise. You can't just, you, it's just like, it's crazy how people work on the construction site. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you look at it and I'm like, for my own houses, like I was just standing and I was like, oh my God, like I want to get a robot. I don't want you guys to do this. They were balancing things. And then the base, the other side was this much lower than the other side in concrete. And they wanted to put timber on it. There was this much gap. They were putting things right below it. And I was like, is this a house going to collapse or not? This is how our industry is working. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think prefabrication is much more um, controllable mm -hmm. and you can do way more with it. And maybe you are right with even concrete printing, you could make it work offsite. Uh, way more than when you do the printing the entire house on site. You know? What do you then, What do you think the um, the big questions are for concrete printing to to make it viable? Like what 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 are the things that need to be solved for that to not you know just be you know the walls or the um, you know to do more with what's out there? Because that that seems to be the technology that has been pushed the most in terms of our like the several sort of startups and companies and buildings that are getting built with that but it also seems the most banal in terms of applications so like what what uh what questions need to be asked or what solutions need to get developed for that to become a more robust sort of construction process I mean, good question. Actually, I mean, the, the main problem in, as you know, in concrete extrusion is tensile property, like tensile property itself. So uh, the pro, I mean, if you, if any, maybe needs, maybe not this, I, I don't know. I don't know how easy, I know how it is easy. Not, it is not easy to replace rebar. I just know it. I know it from all the projects we've done. So um, I know people are working towards 
integration of different kind of fiber and maybe rebar is totally not right for 3D printing. So maybe there is need for reinvention of tensile element when using 3D printing. But the works I've seen so far are very weird, like putting these magnets and then the fibers are like shifting, which is interesting and very innovative. I just was hoping that before the world is ending in the next 80 years, there was a solution mm -hmm. to this. Yeah. And then when we print this for like the other groups that are printing topologically optimized concrete, and then they cast, they put the rebar and then they cast concrete in it, then I'm, it's really a shell. Then why not printing that out of plastic that is thinner? And just, you know, like, I just don't get it. Why are we, we are literally printing a stay in place formwork yet. And if you, wants to function. And for those who don't, they're in compression and there is no durability calculation properly. There's a lot of research in it. I actually don't want to talk because it's a very dangerous area. Um, it's just so dangerous because so many people have so much high skill and a high uh, deep knowledge to it. But if you zoom out, the main problem is tensile. That's why it's not there. The main problem by, and the cold joint, I mean, mm. uh, the cold joint and tensile, even with the cast concrete, durability cast is really like controllable in some way and not in the other way, but durability is an issue. Um, you know, like when, when, when engineers sign that something would not fall for the next 40 years or 100 years, usually minimum, it's they do a lot of dur durability calculation. And uh, I don't know, maybe in the engineering they're doing it and they're doing it in concrete, but I don't see a comprehensive look into this right now. I don't know what to say for concrete, really. I don't want to say something. I'm doing something myself and we are patenting it, but I uh, don't know how successful it would be. And it's not, uh, it's probably going to be more hybrid. It's not going to be this, um, the way it is, no. Uh, and I don't know if that would be successful until we test and say, well, would it, is it more theoretical or would it work? But still, if somebody could develop a solution for uh, rebar, that would be great. Another way to look at it is to uh, come up with new material, completely new material uh, that you can build your buildings with. Yeah. Possible. Well, I, I can keep chatting with you all morning about this. Hopefully, our, our students are, are still here and are interested. Yeah. Do you guys have any questions? that you might want to ask about um, additive manufacturing as a whole. I know you guys are exploring this and uh, Manya is an expert here at your disposal. Does anybody else have questions about, about her presentation or about the, the research that's happening? There is somebody who asked a question and can read it in regards oh, in to the high performance. Oh, okay. Yeah. That. High performance concrete slab. Has there been studies or consideration as to how they would perform in natural disaster, earthquake, fl uh, floods, or non-static scenarios? I don't know. Uh, however, I can say um, high, by high performance, you mean ultra light rate, right? So I see if it's anything this good than bad from my just logistic mind, I would say if you don't have extra material somewhere, then cracking would or breaking would happen way later. later. Um, and uh, uh, even if something breaks, it would you have less in your head than when it was 80% more concrete. There, so I'm just saying uh, there is no, I, I don't know who does the research on it. And if there is one or not, that's a great question to check. But uh, logistically, if you look at nature, it's totally optimal structurally. Like it doesn't have material everywhere. So I don't. I also don't think if earthquake happens, the optimal slab would perform worse than the slab that we have today. I think it would be the other way around actually. Um, that the, the the this massive concrete slab would probably fall earlier. But that would probably be a good research question if somebody hasn't done it even. Any other any other questions out there? Um, I had a I had a, another question. Could any um well I guess not fair, but have you considered applying any of these uh, strategies towards uh, a smaller scale such as furniture or stuff like that? 
Good question. Yes. Oh my God. I have so many students that tested so many furnitures, chairs. I don't know if I could even show you now. I should probably have it somewhere. Yes, it would be definitely, you could, it's certainly easier integrated into furnitures. And so cast aluminum, for instance, uh, it's been um, something that explored significantly plastic printing we have done also. So uh, I think it's a very cool topic and really fun because you don't have to, you can sleep and feel if somebody also falls, is just say back on a bread mother. <laughs> so yes, that's, that's uh, possible. And uh, I think you guys, if you have the chance to explore, it would be one of a very fun, um, fun process. Um, I can, maybe I can quickly show one of the cast chair from my student. I'm just trying to see if, it, yeah, here I have it. Uh, do you want to see? Yeah, it? yeah, that'd be great. That's the very, it's not like it's actually a stool, it's not a chair. <laughs> but they have, there's other ones. I just had this one for another, it was for machine learning. So it's quite stable. <laughs> it's, uh, well, it's one of the that, that was cast in, in aluminium. Was that with the sand, sand cast yeah. or something? Yeah. Yeah, and it uses machine learning. So there was more than one chair, but I mean, for some reason, I only had one of the chair in this present. This is another presentation. So I, I certainly, I have another student who um, is now working on 3D printing an optimal uh, chair uh, with a, uh, we're trying to connect him with, it's a research project. Also, we are trying to connect him to work with the company and, um, it's really the outcomes are so nice and so exciting. It's just, uh, and the result comes in the semester. So right. I, I really uh, support that idea. Just the, would be so fun. The stool reminds me a lot of um, the guys that used to cast into um, like anthills. Have you ever seen those yeah, casts that, where it's sort of like branches everywhere? Yeah, yeah because this, guy, this girl, she also used agent-based design. Ah, okay, to yeah. design so I think the logic is quite similar. Yeah, yeah. Well, but, uh, the, the students are going to be developing their own sort of projects starting pretty, pretty soon. Um, so that those might be potential applications that, that they look into is you know, furniture. Yeah, it's so thing. fun. Yeah, yeah. Chairs, oh my God. Like I would, I would want to 3D print all my furniture. <laughs> Go ahead with it. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here. It was great. I really enjoyed um, hearing about your research and the projects that you've worked on. I'd, I'd love to have you back some other time to talk about projects or be on reviews or give more lectures as your research is developing. Um, thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay. Have a great day, everybody. Bye.